Okay. Okay. So, um, 안녕하세요, 여러분. Um, uh, 저는 아직도 uh, CJ 조금 문제 있잖아요. 그래서 uh, 잘 부탁하세요. Uh, okay, I'm American, so I'm going to uh, speak in English, uh, even though I can't speak in Korean because I'm tired. So, um, thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys for uh, coming today, uh, and I appreciate the invite from the people here at NCSoft, and I appreciate everybody in the audience for taking the time to come down here and, and listen today. So, hopefully, we can. Uh, talk about something uh, interesting for all you guys. As, they, as, sh as she mentioned, I do AI in healthcare, so AI and robotics in healthcare, that is my specialty. I don't really do ethics per se, but I am going to try to talk about it a little bit um, during the presentation. I am from DePaul University, which is in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I used to teach at Hanyang Day actually years ago, so uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to start today's presentation by talking about kind of the technology side, because that's usually what I spend a lot of time talking about, about uh, healthcare technology, uh, particularly AI in healthcare, and robots and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I am going to then try to uh, go quickly through that and then transition over to talking about uh, ethics, because I think that's why everybody's here today to talk about uh, ethics. So. Uh, today's main point is that uh, you know we just heard some great presentations uh, about uh, so responsible AI and um, the, the legal side of AI, uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about healthcare and there's definitely a lot of AI going on in healthcare and there's definitely a lot of ethical issues uh, with the use of AI in healthcare. Right. So um, what's interesting is that one of the big kind of areas of, of AI in healthcare is that uh, it's allowing us to expand the reach of what we used to think about as healthcare, where you got sick, you went to the doctor. Nowadays, we can start to try to change that kind of mindset and talk about how can we use technology and AI to uh, take healthcare and do it beyond the clinic, right? Uh, and that involves a lot of different uh, technologies and a lot of different algorithms. It also raises a lot of different ethical issues, right? So uh, a lot of this is known more broadly. I don't know how much you guys know about healthcare, but people often refer to the, this kind of changing landscape as digital health, right? And that involves a lot of different technologies, smartphones, robots, wearables, um, yeah, VR, uh, all kinds of different stuff, Internet of Things. Uh, and it, the challenge, of course, is uh, nowadays is that uh, in the past, you know, maybe 10 years ago, people were mostly focused on using these technologies to collect data. Uh, but it's actually, and that's one thing we can do, but the challenge is really how do we figure out how to improve human decision making, particularly related to health uh, issues, maybe on the patient side, maybe on the doctor side, using the data collected from these devices. And it turns out that's not so simple. Uh, because human health is complicated. Human biology is quite complicated, right? So uh, digital therapeutics and digital health in general, you, you, some of you guys may know this term, is already a booming industry, uh, and it's expected to grow very very rapidly. It's already a, a multi-billion dollar industry. This is the U.S. alone, uh, and of course, this is going to happen all over the world, um, but it's expected to grow very quickly. So as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff I work on in terms of uh, digital health and AI and healthcare. I want to do it very quickly because that's not really the point of this uh, presentation. Uh, and then we'll switch over to talk about the ethics stuff. But I think it's useful to see what some of these technologies are when we start to talk about the ethical uh, implications of these things, right? Um, so I'll, I'll talk about smartphones, I'll talk a little bit about robots, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, using some of this technology to kind of uh, understand human cognition. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so uh, one really interesting thing, I'll, I'll talk about this first, is you know, it's one of the really interesting things is that uh, with smartphones, we can do a lot of a really interesting uh, kind of stuff with the data in terms of understanding human health, right? So one of the things we work on is we take uh, data from smartphones, from the phones you guys are all probably carrying in your pocket, and we look at how those phones move in your hands when you're typing on them. So you imagine when you're typing, right? You're, your hands will stay perfectly still, right? So uh, what's interesting is that people who have certain illnesses that affect the human brain actually move differently than people who are healthy, right? And we can see it in the data. And so we can use this data from how the phone moves while you type to actually predict, uh, you know, if people have certain diseases or the progression of different diseases, right? And the models for these things are extremely accurate, right? Uh, and it's not just people who are sick. We also can think about more broadly about things like brain health, right? Because we've all have those days where, you know, you're, 
you know, you're supposed to be working, but your brain doesn't work, you know? You're, trying, you're supposed to be typing on the computer, but you have that kind of brain fog, right? We all have those moments, right? So it's not just about people who are sick, but also thinking about health and wellness as well, right? And this applies, of course, we've been doing this on certain diseases, including bipolar and autism and um, multiple sclerosis. Uh, but this applies to any disease that might affect how the human brain works because the human brain, of course, controls how we move. And these, these, these differences in movement are very subtle. It's not visible to the naked eye, but in the data, it's extremely obvious that there's something going on, right? So um, it's really interesting to think about how this can be applied to all kinds of things like dementia and Alzheimer's and all that kind of stuff. Now, another thing we work on is we uh, do a lot of robotics uh, stuff. Uh, technically, I'm a roboticist. Uh, this is a robot we worked on for many years called Paro. Um, it's not the, only, not the only robot we work on, but it's one of them. And of course, these robots are uh, furry and cuddly and cute and all those kinds of things, which is cool. Uh, but they're also full of all these sensors, right, like you see here on the right. Uh, and basically, they are essentially these uh, walking sensor suites, we like to think of them as, right? People think of them as a robot that does stuff, but actually you can collect quite a bit of data from these robots, right? About the things that are going on in people's homes and things going on in their workplace and try to understand how human health changes from day to day in real time, in real life, right? Which is very different than the traditional way of thinking about healthcare, again, where you go to the doctor when you get sick, right? It's like only taking care of your car when it breaks, right? You wait till the wheel falls off and you're like, well, maybe I should go to a mechanic. May not be the best way to deal with these things, right? Uh, and of course, we can collect lots of data from this stuff and kind of connect it to other IoT sensors in people's homes and get a rich array of information about people's uh, daily health, right? So that's a uh, part of it. Uh, and what's interesting too, of course, we can take the data uh, and we can build really interesting models like these generative replay models that we work on. Some of my students, one of my students did this. Um, the interesting thing about this, uh, the last presentation, they were, she was talking about, um, uh, uh, getting a word now that she used, uh, Juan Gak, what is that in English? Uh, hallucination. Wangak. Anyway, sorry. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so she was talking about hallucinations, but we actually use these models to make the to make the AI hallucinate on purpose because one of the theories behind AI right now is that when humans go to sleep, when we dream, we are actually basically um, those dreams are all weird, where you can fly and your arms are really long. What your brain is doing is taking one experience during the day and restructuring it by creating perturbations of the same experience so that you can learn more efficiently from less data, right? And maybe that's how evolution figured out how to create, you know, really high-powered natural intelligence because you don't need a million examples of things to learn how to do stuff, right? A few times you can kind of learn stuff, right? And a lot of learning actually happens when you sleep. And we think part of that is dreaming, right? It's actually these restructuring. So we actually use the um, hallucinations to, on purpose in these systems to allow the models to learn more efficiently, right? So that's, I think, quite interesting. Um, another thing we do, this is actually something uh, we were doing back when I was in Korea, but we actually also build models to uh, have people do things like play video games with AI uh, and look at how that, um, uh, how that actually, what that tells us about their brain health, right? And so we can do all kinds of stuff. You guys, I'm sure, are familiar with transformer models. That's what that is, uh, basically, and have this communicate with people. And just by looking at how people talk and how they play games, we can actually tell a lot about their health, right? Very interesting. We can do the same thing with VR, right? So we're doing uh, a lot of stuff right now with virtual reality where we put people in virtual reality environments for different reasons. Maybe it's uh, for treatment purposes, like this is an example here of physical rehabilitation. Uh, but we're also doing a lot of this stuff with things like autism, right? To try to understand why, what are these triggers for people in the world? And can we collect data about those and create environments where we can kind of teach them how not to react to those in a negative manner, right? So all very interesting stuff, I think. Um, wearables and all that, too. Okay. So uh, that is the technology side of it. 
I'm going to switch over and go to the ethics side of it, because I think that is the point of the day, is to talk about the ethical side of it. And healthcare is really interesting, because there's a lot of really interesting ethical questions, and I'm going to go through just a few of them. Uh, if you want to know more, come take my class in Chicago, because uh, we talk about it quite a bit. Um, but uh, So one really interesting question in AI and healthcare, and this is actually a really huge burning issue, is what happens if something goes wrong, right? Who is liable, right? If an AI recommends a certain treatment and the patient ends up getting hurt or the patient ends up dying, who do you sue, right? Who gets sued? Who gets held accountable? Is it uh, the, the system itself? Is it the doctor who used the AI? Is the patient at fault for listening to the AI's recommendations, right? What about the algorithm designer who created it, right? There's a really big question out there of who exactly do we hold liable in these situations when, when the patient is harmed by something that's produced from AI. And these are unanswered questions, right? In fact, the, um, the federal government in the United States uh, has basically put out a bunch of rules about clinical decision support systems, but honestly, it's kind of the Wild West right now. People really aren't sure how to deal with this, but you know, it's something that we have to uh, kind of try to figure out, right? So another, another ethical issue that we have is that when we're, a lot of these models in healthcare that are being created for AI are actually being built off patient data, right? So they're not possible without the patient's data, and often you need lots of patient's data to build any AI model, right? So we run into this problem then is who gets compensated when we create these AI models? If Google or Amazon or... Samsung or whoever, uh, builds these AI models based on this patient data, are they allowed to keep all the money for themselves? Should the patients be compensated in some way, right? Because it's not possible without the data. Uh, again, this is a question which uh, we talk about in a lot of my classes, but there's not really a clear answer here. In fact, there was a really famous um, case where a, an African-American woman in the United States, her data was used, her genetic data, to create a, uh, a modern lab test that's very fundamental for diagnosing a particular disease, and her family, 50 years later, sued the drug maker who made the medicine, medication and said, we should get some of this money. They actually won. But this is not a settled sort of uh, legal kind of case, even though there's been these sort of one-off situations where people have been able to claw back some of the money. Uh, it's not really clear, you know, how this is going to play out in the long run. One of the problems is that one patient's data is kind of useless. Your data by itself doesn't really tell us anything. Only the data combined from all the patients is actually useful. So if your data is useless until we aggregate it, then what exactly do we owe you? Is it not beneficial for the patients themselves, right? So this is an important issue in the healthcare realm. Who should get compensated? Should the patients get compensated? Another issue, and I think we've heard a little bit about this during the uh, talk about uh, the last two lectures here, but in healthcare, the, there's issues with data privacy, obviously, right? In the digital health space, as we put these robots and these wearables into people's homes, right? We're sending data all over the place. Right? We're transmitting it from your home to the cloud, to the doctor's office, to the pharmacy, wherever. And every time you transmit data, you're basically, there's a huge risk of somebody hacking into it, right? Now, if I'm just sending data around about, I don't know, like, you know, what you watch on Netflix or something, it's not a big deal. But I'm sending data around about your health, your health. That's very sensitive information, right? And so this is an issue where, of course, people are trying to figure out, like, what should we send? How should we send it? Should there be a limit on what's sent? Should we do uh, some computing in, in, in an edge computing environment where instead of sending the data to the cloud, we try to do it on the device? And that means we have to build models that are less complicated because they're not going to run on the limited processing power we have on the device. Again, these are situations where the answer is not entirely clear exactly how we should do this. There's a lot of different people doing lots of different things, um, but definitely this is something that we need to figure out exactly. What is the proper way to do this and what is our comfort level with the risk uh, that is involved when we're transmitting people's health data all over the place, right? From one device to another, to the cloud, whatever, right? So the last one I'll talk about and uh, kind of a big issue is this issue of health equity, right? So one of the problems we have with um, a lot of these cool technologies, I just showed you all these pictures of cool technologies and talked about them for 30 seconds, right? But they're cool and they look cool, right? Those robots look really cool, right? The problem is they cost thousands of dollars. 
So the question is, who exactly are we creating these technologies for? If most of the world's population cannot afford them, then who exactly are we creating all this cool technology for, right? Is it everybody or is it only a certain group of people who can actually afford it, right? And right now, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to argue that we're not only designing all this cool technology for people who can afford it, right? These new, solu uh, these new treatments, these new kind of solutions to people's healthcare problems, right? There's also an issue of limited research here, right? There's a lot of issues that affect the global south or certain minority populations where people are not actually investing the time and money into doing the research for it because you're not going to make any money off of it, right? The drug makers do the same thing. You're not going to make any money off of it, so why should I invest the research into it? It's just plain and simple, you know, supply and demand economics, right? So uh, these are, are all very big problems. Uh, people, of course, try to work on them and are like, we should do better, uh, but, of course, you know, words don't always lead to actual uh, impact in, in the real world, right? So these issues of health equity are actually a big deal in the healthcare space. And one of the things that people are trying to figure out is, is there a way for us to create low-cost technologies that actually can achieve the same effect as some of these higher-cost technologies? Yeah, we all want to live in Star Trek and Star Wars and science fiction, but maybe a simpler solution will actually work just as well and be more accessible to a greater portion of the global population. And maybe that is a better path for us to go down, right? So these are all questions. Uh, I, um, I'm not really an ethicist, so I'm not going to stand up here and pretend to give you guys the answers to it. I'm more a, a computer scientist. Uh, but these are all questions. It summarizes all the last few slides I just showed. These are major ethical questions about the use of AI in healthcare, right? And none of these have a clear consensus answer right now. These are questions I often tell my students. I think it's going to be your generation that's going to have to figure these things out because we are just kind of old and we've, you know, this is going to have more of an impact for younger people than those of us who are kind of into the second halves of our careers or going to be retiring soon, right? So all things that, um, uh, that I think, especially the younger generation, especially when they start to think about AI, they start to think about large language models, they start to think about uh, all this different stuff, is to actually think about what kind of world are we trying to create? Right? And that is often not part of the conversation, unfortunately. Right? And it's definitely, definitely not in healthcare, but I think this is true in a lot of fields. Right? So I was under the impression that I only had 20 minutes and I was going to leave a few minutes for uh, questions, but apparently I don't have to. But uh, I think that's it. I think that's it. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to email me, or I guess we have a Q&A session here in a little bit. But I'm going to wrap up. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for inviting me. Hopefully, uh, I was coherent during most of it. So, uh, thanks. Ganzanda. <laughs> <laughs>